Welcome to the Empowering Teaching Excellence podcast, empowered by academic and instructional services at Utah State University. All right, welcome to our second ETE podcast. We're excited to be here speaking about active learning strategies in face-to-face courses. I'm here with Travis Thurston, and we're so excited to have Kelly Munns with us today. She is a lecturer in our Animal, Dairy, and Veterinary Sciences Department. She's also the coach of the equestrian team. Welcome, Kelly. We're so excited to have you. I'm happy to be here. This is the kind of stuff I like, besides horses. Right. Right. Of course. Yeah. 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 So today we're going to jump into idea paper 53, Active Learning Strategies in Face-to-Face Courses. And so first we wanted to just talk a little bit about active learning. Mm -hmm. One thing I like that uh, the author points out at first is that active learning does not mean having your students sit back on their devices while you're lecturing and actively engage in Facebook or something else, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, However, I I do also want to point out that sometimes instructors uh, are a little worried or uh, they don't know what to think about active learning because they think that means they can't do any lecturing. Uh, So another point that comes up in the paper is that active learning can be added as a supplement to lecturing. Um, So some of the advantages to lecturing are that it enables the instructor to supplement textbook and other material. Uh, Two, it gives the instructor presumed control of the classroom, presumed control of the classroom. Uh, Three, it lets the instructor offer key information that hopefully all students are gathering. And then four, uh, it offers an opportunity for an inspiring teacher to stimulate students. Right, and not everyone can lecture in an inspiring way, so sometimes this, this active learning can be a supplement. So if teachers don't feel particularly confident about their lecturing skills, they can always bring in some active learning to help out. Uh, So what is active learning? Uh, The basic the basic explanation or the basic definition is that it involves student doing things and thinking about what they are doing. Uh, So that can be as simple as uh, a a formative check-in in in class either at the beginning or the end or in between throughout a lecture. Right, which is really nice because as you're lecturing, I mean, kind of the point of being a lecturer or professor is to feed the students that information. And what we want to know is that they're actually learning that information. So that's the great thing about active learning. You can see if your students are getting it. And do you need to adjust something on the fly, on the fly or clarify something? Mm-hmm. So that's one of the great components of this active learning when we're lecturing. Well, it's catching them in that first moment of learning something so that they can associate it with this activity, and then they can have that information to refer back to. I feel if they're having fun while learning something, I feel students will keep it with them. At least that's my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly that if the students are active in it and there's kind of some fun in there, it's engaging, that the students are definitely going to keep that information long term. Yeah, and the paper would add that uh, active learning can also include critical thinking, mm-hmm. right? So even if you're pushing students um, academically, uh, they'll, they're more likely to engage, right? Yeah. Uh, specifically, uh, the author talks about pushing students into those higher order levels of blooms as well. So rather than talking about facts and figures and some of those basics below, we want to move up and think about analyzing and applying and evaluating, things of that nature. And I know in ADVS in the equine science courses I teach, I like to talk about the misconceptions or the old traditions that we have in equine science and some of the new innovations coming out. And that's the great thing, too, when we start talking about our learning outcomes and pushing into that higher order. Like, yeah, let's analyze it. Let's take this information. Is there something new out there with the research? So that's a great part of this, too. Mm-hmm. Good. So now that we've, we've talked a little bit about active learning, we're going to lay the groundwork, um, as Millis talks about. Uh, one, one quote that I really like from Lang from 2007 in the paper here is that the most effective teaching is transparent teaching. Right, absolutely. So laying the groundwork for active learning is really important, and the best place to do this is in a syllabus. You want to make sure your students know what your motives are for doing this active learning. And in that way, they can kind of come prepared to class to do those kinds of things. 
Yeah, that, that actually ties quite well into adult learning theory, right? right? If we provide a rationale for why we're doing this, the students are much more willing to, to buy in, so to speak. Yeah, I agree. And Lang also says to step away from the Oz screen, which I'm assuming means the Wizard of Oz. So <laughs> you've got this big head talking to you, but you're really not understanding what's going on behind it. So laying that groundwork, um, he also says, um, by sharing teaching learning philosophies in the course of the syllabus and making students part of the learning process, you're, tu you're turning your students into teachers themselves. So really that discussion of the things that are going to be happening in the class, I really like that idea that you're coming, you're, you're talking to them through the syllabus, that's your first point of contact, but then when you come to class, you're talking to your students about what's going to be happening and make them a part of that learning process. Absolutely. Uh, so now we're going to jump into some of the tips uh, that are offered in this paper. Uh, first, tip number one is thinking aloud pair problem solving, or TAPS. Yeah, and this kind of goes back into what I was just saying um, earlier, is giving the students a problem, giving them a misconception that's out there, and then letting them kind of solve that out themselves. Or maybe they have a misconception or an understanding um, of the information, and they can kind of go with a partner and talk about that. So for example, um, we could talk about the way we feed horses, which very traditionally is twice a day. We feed them meals like we feed ourselves. And so is that what a student has done traditionally in the past? And are there any new innovations or research out there that maybe that's not the best way to do it? So you can set two students up or somebody can pose that question mm -hmm. to a peer, and then the peer can kind of work through it, talk, uh, talk about it, and then the student that posed that question can either further ask more questions to get some clarifications or they can reverse the roles which is really great right great way for them to engage with peers and have that discussion and take the information along with it yeah and what I really like about this is that you're opening this up to questions I think we have a lot of students who come into a college setting especially new students or maybe non-traditional students who may not have been in a classroom before who don't they may have questions, but they don't know how to ask them. So I think opening this up and allowing them to ask questions and then talk about it and then ask more questions is really important because then they get those questions answers and they're not just you know, stuck in their head and they're not worried about asking. Right, them. or just trying to grasp it from a text, exactly, right? Yeah. Which if it took just textbooks and PowerPoints, I'm not you sure why you, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're paying us for then. Not, yeah. 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 So, so if we were to push TAPS even a little bit further, we could think about problem-based learning or, or inquiry-based learning in the classroom as well, which will actively involve the students in, in learning more about a topic. Yeah, which is so wonderful when we're talking about science concepts is giving that student a question out there and seeing what they come up with, which is really great. And again, it's a way to get them engaged. It's a way to get them talking about the content. Perfect. All right, uh, tip number two is the three-step interview. Or also, this is sometimes called the blob activity, which I really, I would prefer calling it the blob activity, really. <laughs> So this can be used as an icebreaker in a class or even as a participatory set right at the, the very start of class. And you start by um, having one student designated as the explainer. Um, and then you have questioners. So this is kind of similar to TAPS, but in a different way, you start involving other groups. So you start with a pair of individuals, and then you bring in another pair to create a group of four until you create this Blob. blob. <laughs> right? So you continue having them asking questions and, and working through an issue. So I see this as sort of a, a community learning activity. Do you feel that way where they're learning from other experiences? The way they're thinking about it is different from the way their peers are thinking. And so they're taking this, they're explaining, they're asking questions, they're using that, that interviewing method, but then they're sort of reforming their thoughts or answers based on what their peers are saying as well. So they're getting these new ideas and they're taking it another step further. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, I, I really like this, as the paper mentions, as, a, as an icebreaker mm -hmm. because it gets the students talking to each other. Right. Right. And like you said, Aaron, getting them to consider different ideas. Right. So especially at the start of a, a new course, 
a lot of students come in, they think they know what the topic is, they think they know what they're going to be learning about, and, and it actually helps them to see there's a lot of different perspectives. Right, which would be interesting to see in, in maybe a, um, a sociology class or a religious studies class where everyone comes in with a different background, a different point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Or even in any kind of um, equine class as well, if someone was raised taking care of horses, maybe it's different from the way someone else was raised taking care of horses and they've got different methods and ways of doing things. So getting to know those things and also learning from the teacher is really important as well. Yeah, all the various disciplines that the students experience and the vastness of that industry. Good, that brings us to tip number three, which is my favorite. I know, I was just gonna say that same thing. That's <laughs> one of my favorites too. So that's the think, pair, share. So this is such, in a lot of ways, it's a simple way to engage and if it's, if you're a little nervous about engaging your students, this is a really great start um, to doing some active learning in your lectures. So basically, I think pair share is you're gonna pose this question and you're gonna ask the students like, hey, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. Think about this question. And you pose the question and you watch your clock and you give them 30 seconds and you say, now the person to your left or the person to your right, go ahead and talk about, it. I'll give you another 30 seconds, 45 seconds, talk with your partner about your answers to that question. And then you're gonna ask the class as a whole, like, okay, I'm gonna pick on the partners over here or on the other side of the classroom, and I want you to share what you and your partner came up with um, together for the answer to this question. And the really great thing about this, I find is for those students that are a little more introverted, mm -hmm. that maybe they aren't gonna raise the hand and offer, but they have a really great answer, a really great insight into this. And so, and maybe they still aren't the one that answers it to the whole classroom, but that idea gets shared through the partner that they had, right. which is really incredible, right? Or maybe they get a little bravery because they have a partner, it's their idea, not just them out there by themselves. Oh, absolutely, right. and, and on that same point, they've had the chance to think about it, yes. and then kind of talk it out with one person before they share it out to the rest of the class. So they're organizing their thoughts mm -hmm. before they have a chance to share. Which kind of goes with that wait time concept, uh, which is really, I mean, it's very, very popular in K-12, but talking about that wait time where some students process incredibly fast and they can get a question posed and boom, they have an answer for it. Right or wrong, they'll have an answer. The great thing about that, the processing in that time, hey, it's your time to think about it. It's your time to share with a partner. That wait time is the ones that maybe need some more time to process it. They now have that time instead of somebody shooting their hand up and answering the question. So that's another great component of this think, pair, share. And I also like the adaptability of it, Yes. right? So you can use it, instead of saying the, the think at the first, mm -hmm. if they have a, a journal, like a reflection journal or something like that, point. you can have them writing it out. And so that's another step is as they're having these ideas, as they're thinking about it, they can actually be writing it down in their journal, which then makes it easier to share, mm -hmm. right? Once you've kind of thought about it, written it down, it, it makes it seem a little less scary to share. Yeah, I agree with that. One final point that they offer in the paper, or that she offers in the paper, is that it also is somewhat of a time saver to get a lot of different students engaging at once. So realistically, you have half of your class all vocalizing, all sharing at the same time. Whereas maybe in a traditional lecture question style, you may only get one or two or three perspectives shared across the entire cohort during class. Right, or one that's monopolizing all of the time. <laughs> Which there's always that student. We love them, they are so yes. fantastic, but there's always gonna be that student. Yep. Okay, tip number four is a visible quiz. Um, the way they show this in the, in the, in the paper is kind of the, the poor teacher's way to <laughs> yeah, use clickers, yeah. right? <laughs> so you can, you can literally write like A, B, C, or D on a piece of paper for the students to hold up. Uh, another way this is done is, is by having them write on like a whiteboard or... That's what I have in my I, classroom currently. I always, think I, whiteboards <laughs> I always think the visualization for me is always like bar trivia. I don't know if you guys it's have ever seen. Like yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like any kind of, you know, you just form a group and you're holding up your answer. That's kind of the visualization I see, just in That's case true. anyone was, didn't quite get what it was. <laughs> <But> <laughs> That's you, always what I see. But you can do that on that point. You can do that 
on an individual basis, mm -hmm. so you can have the students individually thinking about it, or in small group or right. pairs, have them discuss it and then come up with an answer. So it can be used in a variety of ways. And the great thing about a visible quiz is you can insert a slide on your PowerPoint, and it'll help remind you to kind of break up lecturing, talking to the students, to get them engaged in the content, which is really wonderful. So like, okay, here's my moment as you know, a lecturer, a teacher, an instructor to, okay, yeah, I got to engage my students here in that active learning process. So you can put that question up on your PowerPoint and you can either give them the papers or me the whiteboards <laughs> that I pass out if you don't have the technology in there. Um, so that's a great thing too for some of our professors or instructors that aren't quite comfortable with this active learning at this moment. That's true. And one thing I like specifically about Plickers is that it it provides you a formative check-in with your students yeah. and a bonus is that it's free, right? Yeah. You can print out a whole set yes. of the Plicker cards for yeah. free. That's that's really helpful. So Kelly, you you actually used Plickers in I your did. keynote address at yep. the ETE conference in 2017. I sure did. <laughs> Which was awesome. It was really incredible. There were so many people that using the Plickers was just yeah, a great way to go. which was cool in this presentation. Sometimes as a presenter, it, especially in a conference setting like this, there isn't a lot of active learning going on. Mm -hmm. So this was a wonderful way for me to get the entire crowd involved in what I was talking about through this Plickers. And I just had to take my phone. I, I literally took my iPhone and I scanned the room uh, to see what they were doing in terms of this information, what they answered. So. I mean, sometimes that's the problem is people are like, oh, but I teach, you know, 300 students in this big auditorium. Uh, and, right, I agree, that, that does get tough. But here I did it, the same thing, lots of numbers, mm -hmm. to get this big of a group actively involved in what I was talking about. Yeah, and you can see it right there. Yeah. And what I, what I also really like is that either, whether you're using, like, your phone or a tablet, once you scan all those cards, it gives you a breakdown of how many students said A or B or C or D. Right, right. you have that real-time Yes, feedback. exactly. Yeah. It's that real-time check-in with your students to see if they're getting it, maybe what it is they're missing, and it provides you an opportunity right then to reteach or to discuss with the class maybe where the confusion is. Yeah, if you see a... C was not the answer, but an overwhelming amount of the students picked it. A, you can see a misconception there. You can see like, oh, okay, like that kind of makes sense where they go with that information, and I need to clarify that right now in this moment, which is really incredible that you can do that. That's a great thing about formative assessments in this manner. It doesn't have to be worth points. It's just a check-in for the understanding on the learning. And it's better to do it now than it is maybe for them to get it wrong on an exam mm -hmm. and then... I mean, it's always good to go back and, and reteach, but it would be great to do it right in your lecture yep. so that they know, and then when the exam comes, they'll know it. Yep, and you've clarified that. Yep. Our last tip uh, is the jigsaw strategy, or jigsaw group learning, and I really love this one. <laughs> it's a great, great strategy. So, so to explain it, you set up your students into small groups and you assign them each a letter or a color or a topic. And then from there, you break them out into an expert group. So all of the students that are, we'll say, that were assigned to be read, go and they work together and they discuss a topic and they come up with a solution to some, some questions that you've set up beforehand. And once this expert group has come up with these answers, then they go back to their original group and each person in the group gets a chance to share out. So everyone's learning and everyone is actually teaching as well. Mm -hmm. And you as a group are growing. Right. And as an instructor, what a great time that um, term proximity, walking around your room so that you actually get close to your students and you can hear the discussions going on, which is really great. And you can provide some insight or some clarification if you hear an expert group struggling a little bit, which is really great too. So that's the way you can kind of be involved in that learning process of the jigsaw. Even though they're becoming the experts, they're becoming the teachers, um, that's one way you can work through that classroom, which is really fun kind of takes it off of you, but then you're going to interact within all your students. Absolutely. 
And it's a great way, using the jigsaw technique, it's a great way to cover a large topic in a shorter amount of time. Because yeah. you can break it up between the different groups and they can all be learning at the same time. Right, like a great example would be when we talk about cells and then we talk about all the components of the cells, you can make everybody an expert on each part of that cell and then come back and then teach about their component, which is exactly what a jigsaw would look like and then that whole thing got covered. Yeah. Well, great, guys. This has been fantastic. Yes. The way the paper finishes out uh, is they just say that active learning is a well-tested approach that teachers can use in their classrooms right away in a variety of ways. And in every discipline. In every discipline, absolutely. And so we want to encourage our instructors to, to start incorporating active learning strategies into their classrooms. And always, as always, if you have questions, you can always come to the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction and we can give you these tips. We can make sure that you know what these active learning tips are and then so you can use them in your classroom. And we always like to let everyone know that we're here to help not only online teachers, but we're here to help face-to-face -face teachers. And that's one of the reasons why we did this podcast. Yeah, and that's how I found them is you just, I needed some help with some certain things and I utilize them all the time. City is a wonderful tool we have here. I really Thanks. like you guys. <laughs> I mean, adding a plug in, but it does incredible. The great thing is, is even some outside insight, like I might be really good at this active learning and you guys can make me even better, which it's ever evolving, right? You can't ever, you're never done being a good instructor. Exactly. Absolutely. You guys help that. Thanks, Kelly. We're yeah. glad that you came to us. Thank you for joining us for this ETE podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Empower Teaching and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Empower Teaching. We want to thank Kelly Munns for offering her insights on this topic today. Uh, join us next time as we discuss Idea Paper 57, The Flipped Classroom. Thanks. Mm -hmm.